All righty. Thanks so much for joining us again on another edition of Will and Friends Live. Today we have Danny Swanson. He is the founder and CEO of Swanson Home Inspection. And we're going to be talking about the most common things that are found in the home inspection and just other, other myths or other questions that a lot of people have when you have a home inspection. But before we get into that, Danny, for those who do not know you, can you share with them a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, Danny Swanson, owner of Swanson Home Inspections. Uh, been performing residential home inspections for about 10 years now under my own business. Prior to that, uh, 10 years experience in a specific uh, commercial inspection trade um, and where I was suddenly let go one day because of the economy and uh, sparked Swanson Home Inspections and haven't looked back since. That's awesome. That's awesome. At the same time, it sounds like from when we were talking, you had some experience even from your young age, from your dad and your grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Uh, various trades regarding uh, home construction. I've been involved in pretty much all of them. The only ones I haven't done physically or have my personal touch is uh, roofing and plumbing. Um, but I've been around it all. I uh, grew up doing electrical work with my father, who, uh, as I said before, was a policeman by trade, but uh, in the evenings would do electrical work for all of his uh, fellow police officers and so we wired up many garages and additions and built cabins and things like that for a lot of his co-workers. Uh, my dad learned that trade from his father who was an electrician by trade had his own business Swanson Electric um, and then my uncle as well, as well my dad's brother uh, he was an electrician by trade so that's my roots um, and then I just followed on through you know I worked for a, a a friend of mine out of high school uh, who was a contractor um, doing framing and electrical work and all that fun stuff. I've been in the flooring industries, uh, finished cabinetry. I've, I've pretty much done almost all of it. That's awesome. For those who are looking at, I know there's a lot of people graduating soon from college or high school. Those who are looking to get into home inspection or general contracting. What, what would you, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, you do need hands-on experience, in my opinion, to be a, uh, a good home inspector, because um, you, you've got to have an understanding of what you're looking at and how it operates. It's, uh, it's easy to point things out and, and say, this is wrong from getting uh, maybe computer or uh, book education, but the hands-on knowledge is really what sets you apart because then you can qualify what's wrong. You can say, right. you know, yes, this is incorrect. However, it's a pretty simple repair or, hey, this is a pretty major repair. This has been patched and you have that, uh, that experience to back that up. Makes so sense. I would advise anybody wanting to do it to uh, get involved in the trades, speak, you know, we'll go to work for a contractor, become a home builder. There's plenty of work out there to do that. Um, mm -hmm and get a few years experience and, and bounce around. Don't just stick to one thing. Like I said, you know, I, I did a little bit of everything. Don't be just a framer. When, you're, when you get that framing experience, maybe move on to a finished carpenter or a window installer or something like that, you know, drywaller. Just, uh, you're gonna be exposed to it and you're gonna learn a lot that way, a lot more than any course is gonna teach you. Nice, nice. So just as a reminder for those joining us, thank you so much for joining us on Will and Friends Live. Today, we have Danny Swanson, uh, of the CEO and founder of Swanson Home Inspection, and he's going to be talking about the home inspection process, things that people, most common questions that people ask about. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment section, wherever it may be, and then we'll be aware of that and ask Danny, or maybe you can ask him himself if you're on our webinar on Zoom. Danny, let's get into it. I know we have about 30 minutes or so, and I know you're a busy man, so we'll try to keep it, we'll keep it tight in that regard. All right. There are, we were talking about, there were about 10 to 12 common findings in the home inspection. And before we even get into that, some people have the idea that when they purchase a home and get into escrow, that they're going to find nothing wrong with the property. And the home inspection is going to be clean, no issues, nothing wrong with that. Can you provide some context there on if that's yeah. true or not? Yeah. Um, even a brand new home has problems. Uh, people just don't know what to look for or are not knowing where to look for the problems. Um, as a home inspector, we come in and we look at that home with, uh, uh, with scrutiny. 
and we climb around in the attic. We run all your HVAC systems. We run all your appliances that are there. Uh, we test everything. We open every window. We check every outlet that we can get to. Um, we go through that home looking for mechanical defects. That's our job. Whereas when people are looking at a home to buy, they're looking at, they're you know, picturing themselves. Can I you know, see myself drinking coffee here and getting ready for work or come, relaxing for the evening there and, and falling in love with the, the look and the feel? Um, we're gonna look at your doors. We're gonna see if they shut, open and shut properly, if they're rubbing, if they're sagging, if there's screws missing in the hinges, if the uh, hardware is working properly. And we're gonna find those issues. Um, we're gonna find an issue in every home because there is no perfect home. Right. Even um, even new construction homes. Some people think like right. these are brand new, just built. There's not going to be any issues. So I'm <laughs> like, sorry to break it to you. Yeah. You're going to probably find something. Yeah. You know, people think when a home is new, it's built by the builder. There's this one uh, entity, the builder building this home. And that's simply not the case. That entity is hiring many different uh, contractors and crews to build that home. And those contractors and crews have subcontractors and crews. So you never know the, qualifi the qualifications of the person who actually physically built the house that you're buying. And we find lots of issues um, where they've, they're running the HVAC improperly. The ducting is, is routed inside where there's a chimney and you're not supposed to do that. Or the, the, uh, the condensate drain lines are reversed and you run your air conditioning and you notice over the patio or over a window, you've got a waterfall. What's that about? Well, right, right. <laughs> it's an easy yeah. fix. It's a simple fix, but it's wrong and it needs to be fixed. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so we, we know that inspections or the, with, with the home inspection, there's going to be some type of findings. And as an agent representing the buyer, I'm there to negotiate on their behalf to find or negotiate the, the major health and safety issues. Yes. We're not just going to, there's going to be things that are going to be on there that we're not going to be asked for because they're not major health and safety issues. And especially if it's a seller's market and it's not a hot seller's market right now, but Right now we're seeing multiple offers on certain homes and we can't ask for everything under the sun because if we do and the sellers are perturbed by it or don't want to fix any of that, then they'll go with another buyer that's behind yeah. us. And so we don't want to be doing that, but at the same time, we want to identify the major health and safety issues, bring it to the attention of the seller and figure out what's the best, best, best solution for that, whether it be meeting in the middle, having them fix it all, providing credit, so on and so forth. But we'll get in, so that's just an idea of the home inspection process. But in regards to findings, with a lot of people staying at home right now, sheltering in place, they're in their kitchen a lot. <laughs> so Danny, talk to us a little bit about the findings that you find in the kitchen that are most common in the home inspection report. You'll probably talk about each and every job you do. Yeah, um, kitchen findings are typically, um, there's three that stand out every time. Your oven doesn't have an anti-tip device on it. Uh, which if you open the oven door, if it's a standing, a freestanding oven, you open the oven door and you're going to see a little sticker in there that shows a child crawling up on the door and the, and the oven toppling over on the child. That's been uh, uh, something that's been required since 1991 is having an anti-tip device installed. So when you have an oven delivered and installed, the installers are supposed to, by law, put that in. A lot mm. of people will go to the big box store and buy the oven themselves and bring it home and slide this thing in place after they've hooked up the gas line and, and then wonder what this bracket is that's in the bottom warming drawer and just kind of toss it aside. Um, so and it's, it's similar that. sort of to like the bookshelves, right? Like exactly. the bookshelves, if you have kids, yeah. especially if it, there's an earthquake that we have, the books might topple over or the shelf might topple over. Yeah. So that's why you have a little bracket and similar for the oven. Very, yeah, very similar, except uh, it won't topple over in an earthquake. It's typically because uh, toddlers like to climb on that door. Or exactly. if you have a child that, that is just, you know, a younger child, maybe four or five, um, is trying to get up to the popcorn that you just popped in the microwave above it or something, they stand on that door to get them height. And then the whole thing topples over. And it has happened. And it's, it's pretty tragic, the results. So we check for the anti-tip device. Again, safety issue very simple to repair uh it's not something that we're gonna it's gonna break the bank in that sense it or it's gonna jeopardize the deal it's relatively simple whether sellers take care of it or not um yeah. nothing i to think so you know, you know typically i think most of my findings about 90 percent of my findings are typically that way they're not gonna make or break the deal um when we get into 
if the roof is in bad shape or there's been some remodel and they didn't properly do the, uh, the trusses in the attic and things like that, where it gets very, very costly, that's when I think things get questionable, but you see that more than me. But back to the kitchen issues, you know, you got the anti-tip device, which I touched on, and then there's uh, a GFCI outlets. Uh, we we like What's to see- What's GFCI stand for, if you don't mind? Ground fault circuit interrupt. So that's the plugs that you typically see around the sink that have little buttons on them where you can reset it. There's one that says test and one that says reset. Those are there uh, to protect you from getting shocked. If your hands are wet or if something splashes out and gets the, the appliance wet that's next to the sink, it won't arc or spark, it's going to trip that GFCI and kill the power at that, that point. It used to be those were required within six feet of the sink. Today, the your GFCI protection is required throughout the entire kitchen on every countertop outlet and on the islands. So we're checking for that. Now, in a home that was built in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, we're not going to find typically that every outlet is GFCI protected. So it's not really a defect, but I'm still letting you know that you may want to update it to meet current standards because it's just a safety thing. So that's probably the second most common thing. Maybe the And first. then there's another thing that I didn't think about, but an air gap and a dishwasher. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about that too? Yeah, the old air gap. So when you're standing at the sink, uh, in a, most cases you'll find at the back of the sink, there's a chrome knob back there just kind of hanging out. Nobody knows what it's for. It has a little hole in it. It's just kind of ugly and unsightly. Um, that's actually very important. That's part of your dishwasher draining system. Uh, it's called an air gap. So when you uh, run your dishwasher and it hits the drain cycle, the dirty water is going to run down under the sink up to that air gap, up into a pipe, and then it has to jump a gap, which is the air gap, to get down and drain down to your garbage disposal, typically, if you have a garbage disposal or into just the drain line. The purpose of it is to keep uh, debris and sewage back up and things from uh, like that nature from migrating back into your dishwasher, which is a sanitary environment. So if you're running food down your garbage disposal, which we all do, uh, that food's getting chopped up and spun around and it's going into the port where the dishwasher drain line plugs into. So it's sort of getting direct injected into that dishwasher drain line. And if you do that long enough, it's going to migrate back into the dishwasher. Um, the air which gap is, is a high point. Which is absolutely gross. No one, I don't know if a lot of people know that, but yeah. it's just like, wait a second. It's disgusting. I I, a lot of times that you want to use the hand pump like you're talking about, do you rather have soap instead of a little air gap because yeah. who actually uses it or when does it actually work or function? But yeah. recently it, it functioned for us. And we're like, oh, wow, things spit out when we actually just cleaned it. It's crazy. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the signs that you have an issue. If you uh, run your dishwasher and you see water coming out of the air gap and dripping into the sink, you know that the drain line is plugged at the garbage disposal and you want to get that cleaned. And if you've ever done that, you know it's very smelly and gross. <laughs> right. But at the same time, it's good for buyers to know that if there isn't one, that they would need to install it. So that might look like yeah. Maybe creating a hole in the countertop, changing out the countertop, or it could be a different on, solution that contractors have. Yeah, there, you know, there's some easy ones where there's already a hole in the sink with a plug and you just pop the plug and throw your air gap in there. Or maybe you have a, a soap dispenser that's in the sink. Uh, I always recommend you know, replacing it with the air gap and get rid of that soap dispenser because they're always empty and they're kind of hard to deal with. Um, or you may have an under counter sink with granite countertops and people think, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? There's right. granite, it's stone. Well, yeah. it's pretty simple. Uh, any, it. Anybody familiar with tile work can drill a hole in that granite and uh, throw in that $12 air gap. Makes sense. Makes sense. So those are some of the common findings within a home. So nothing to, again, nothing to fret over or cancel a deal over. Right. But yes, something would need to be addressed in some way. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's other things uh, that we were talking about. One of them was the roof maintenance. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? You, I'm sure you find different ages of homes and different condition of roofs. Yeah, so um, your, your typical roof is a uh, composition shingle. That's vastly the most common roof, which is uh, the roof that looks kind of like sandpaper. Um, and it's beige or brown and, and sometimes gray with black shades. Anyway, composition shingle roofs um, can last, you know, 25, 35 years typically. 
And when we get up there and look at them, what we're looking for are loose, torn, missing shingle tabs. Um, also, maybe some that aren't adhered properly, or maybe they're not nailed properly. We find that, that people that installed them uh, didn't quite install them properly. And so when they're not nailed down properly or at the right area where they apply the nails in the right spot on those shingles, which have a, a little painted line to do so, uh, you're at risk of losing shingles, shingle tabs when it's really windy. Also, if you're looking at the roof and you see um, a glistening of it, you know, the sunlight glistening off the top, that's a sign that you're getting granule loss, which is that sand that's adhered to it. And uh, it's exposing the fiberglass mat that the, the shingle tabs made out of. And that's just a sign of age or mm. you know, something rubbing the roof or people accessing it for whatever reasons and creating a path. So we we're gauging the condition of the roof. I can't ever tell you the age of the roof unless somebody shows me paperwork as to when it was installed. Because that's one of the most common questions. How old is the roof? How much longer do I have? Well, I can tell you what kind of shape it's in. I can tell yeah. you how old I think it might be, but it's nothing concrete and you can't hold me to it. Do you know, um, I, obviously you're not a roof contractor. That's not your specialty. But at the same time, on average, how long are roofs, roofs last for before you have to change them out? They're typically 25 year, unless somebody spends money to get the 35, 45. There are roofs that, you know, will go many, many decades, but they're very expensive. And, you know, what, just getting what, what kind of roofs are those? What kind uh, of materials? You got slate tile, concrete tile. Um, you even have uh, stamped steel uh, tile roofs. They are actually very, very nice and they last a long time. Actually, my brother has a stamped steel tile roof on his house that is mangled from being <laughs> accessed so much. Um, but the darn thing, man, never, never leaks. Nothing's missing. No, it's just holding up. And it looks like it's probably 100 years old, though it's not. <laughs> so funny. Hey, curious, Danny, have you have you dealt with a home where there are solar panels or tes uh, not Tesla, but those type of solar panels where it's, the it's like embedded machine? into the roof? I have not seen those yet. I, I did get a quote to put those on my house. Um, which was ninety thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> so wow. I passed on that. I wonder when you get the ROI. When that comes back? Yeah, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> when you're yeah. when you have great great grandchildren, or yeah, you, you got to pass the house on for for many years for that <laughs> many right. generations. Right. But I haven't been on those yet. I, I would love to see that. They also have paint that is solar generating. You know, paint. I haven't seen that yet personally either. Interesting. Interesting. So there's, there's things to be on the lookout for roofs that you have experience looking into. There's some other things that are, are very hot button. One of the questions, which is relatively simple, you can find this at Costco Home Depot, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. Yeah. Are we supposed to have them? How many are we supposed to have? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Smoke detectors, you need one uh, in, on each level in the common areas um, and one in each bedroom. If you have a hallway with a door separating the hallway from the common area of the house, like the living room, you should have a smoke detector on both sides of that hallway door. So that means you need you have one in the hallway outside the bedrooms, one in the common area, maybe a family room area, and then one in each bedroom. And then CO detectors are one per level in the common areas. Typically we see them, it's either a, a smoke detector, CO detector combo unit on the ceiling, or it's a standalone CO detector unit on the wall that's battery powered. They also have the ones that plug into an outlet. Yep. Um, you know, there's several options there. I always say, you know, get the combo units. It's the best way to go. It's less to install. <laughs> right. that's, so there's value there, but in regards to effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure they all are effective. Yes. But at the same time, like if you have a carbon monoxide detector on your ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, it sort of doesn't make sense, right? Cause like carbon, you would think it wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense common sense wise. However, okay. studies have been done and they show that just the natural turbulence within the home will take that CO emission and circulate it everywhere in that house just as effectively. So that, that unit is going to detect it just as effectively if it, as if it was down low. Um, it's sort of like putting uh, food coloring inside a glass of water uh, it, you see it just swirl around in there, even though the balance may be a little different from the water, it's still affecting the water completely. Same thing with the CO detector. That's a good illustration. Because I thought, I was like, oh, carbon's going to be on the floor. So you probably want your carbon monoxide detector closer to the floor as possible, like in your kitchen or something like that. So it'll pick it up better. 
but yeah. that makes total sense. Yeah, the only other thing you want to be careful with the CO detector is you don't want it within 10 feet of any gas fired appliance. So if you have a, a furnace that's in a closet in a hallway, make sure that CO detector is 10 feet away from there if you can. Some homes and condos, you can't. You just got to do the best you can, get it as far away as possible. Uh, downstairs, keep it away from the fireplace, keep it out of the kitchen. Uh, you want it in a common walkway area, um, like a hallway. Makes sense. And just as a reminder, for those who are joining us, thank you so much for joining us. I have Danny Swanson. He's the founder of and CEO of home, Swanson Home Inspection. And we're just talking about the common findings in the home inspection. And if you have any questions, feel free to message us and we'll be on the lookout for those and ask Danny about them. But Danny, so we talked about the carbon and smoke detector. Another big question that often comes up is asbestos. Asbestos, yeah. Yes, Dirty talk work. to us a little bit about that. Why are uh, people so concerned? Why are there additional testing some people take? To talk to us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, um, people are concerned because they're concerned about anything that's a health risk and asbestos is a, uh, a hot button. Uh, typically, I shouldn't say typically, most of our homes here in Southern California contain some form of asbestos. Uh, especially the homes that are, you know, from the 80s on back. Uh, it's either going to be in some of the uh, HVAC venting material, which is called transite. Uh, it's a clay type pipe that the uh, furnace vents are, are running through to go to the exterior. Could be in your uh, drywall, in your drywall tape. Uh, could also be in your attic, uh, in the HVAC ducts and in what's called vermiculite, uh, which is an older style um, insulation that looks like rock pebbles up in the attic. So you know, it's, it's uh, pretty common to come across it. Now, when I come across it, I can't identify it as saying, hey, this is asbestos. I have to say suspected asbestos material because I did not test it. I'm not a lab. Um, however, we see this day in and day out. We kind of know, you know, what's likely to be asbestos. And I talk to my clients in real terms. Um, so if I go up into an attic and I find that you've got HVAC ducts that look like they're made out of asbestos, now I'm really paying attention to the condition of them. Not that I wasn't before, but extra more so because it's a health uh, uh, concern now. Right. So I'm looking to see if somebody's uh, crawled over a duct and damaged it, if they put their foot through it, if they've stored something up there and has poked a hole in it. Because when you damage asbestos, it, it becomes what's called friable. It releases the fibers that are in the asbestos that are known to cause mesothelioma. And when it releases that, it releases it into the air and it circulates around. So you certainly don't want it uh, circulating through an HVAC duct and pumping into a bedroom, per se, you know, per se. I have had that in a, in a situation where it was the, the, the daughter's room and mm. mother had no idea. And I was wow. up there and, and just pumping it full of, you know, asbestos fibers. And I, I had to let the seller know, listen, you need to get this fixed right away um, because it's a health concern. Um, so, you know, we do come across it. The, the fix, if you have asbestos ducts, uh, you can get new ducting put in. Uh, you can have tests done to see if there's asbestos in your insulation because of that damage and have the insulation replaced out. Uh, there's things you can do to fix it. If it's in your drywall, you would never know. And the only time you would be concerned is if you're doing a remodel and you're pulling dr down drywall. That's when you want to make sure you test it prior to that. You have a little piece of it or you find a tape joint and you have a piece of that tested. If it tests positive for asbestos, then you make sure you take the precautions, have the right people do your remodel and seal off the area. Um, otherwise, what's going to happen? It's, it's in a wall behind many layers of latex paint. Uh, it's not really going to hurt anybody unless you're chewing on the wall. <laughs> well, here's the question, right? I, I know it was a style probably in the 70s, 80s, maybe early 90s, but you saw popcorn ceilings and popcorn ceilings known to have some percentage of asbestos. Yeah, yeah not all of it, but right. much of it, quite a bit of it does. So there again, you can just scrape off a little piece and send it off to be tested and find out. And uh, if it has it and you want to scrape your ceilings because it looks so much better than that popcorn, uh, be sure to have it done by a qualified professional. So you wouldn't do it yourself like painting because some people are like, oh, that should be easy. I'll just, just like painting, I'll do it myself. Yeah, well, you know, uh, there's things I would do myself, but I wouldn't tell my clients to do themselves. <laughs> um, so anytime you're dealing with health 
uh, issues like that, you want to make sure the proper steps are taken because, you know, the last thing you want to do is find out, you know, 40 years down the line, you or one of your children has mesothelioma and, it, and it, you have that in the back of your head. Was it the asbestos I exposed them to? Right. You um, saved a couple of dollars, maybe saved a couple thousand dollars, but yet your health was impacted. Yeah. And now, now your, your mental state will be affected possibly because no one wants to live with that guilt. Right. For sure. For sure. I think this is a very similar route going into mold, right? Yeah. I know you're not a mold expert. You're not going to be able to test for it. And yet at the same time, you, you see there's certain things that are signs of potential for mold. Yeah. And I'm not a testing lab. So when I see it again, the mold is a four letter word. We're not supposed to say, Oh, you got mold. Um, we're supposed to say uh, organic growth or, or bio appearing growth. Um, mildew is mold. Uh, <laughs> penicillin's mold, you know, made from mold. Uh, right. So I'm looking for it. And I, and a lot of times I have clients that are concerned about it. I've had many who are very sensitive uh, to mold. In fact, a good friend of mine uh, who was an inspector uh, that I knew several years ago, he, you walk in and if his nose was going, that meant there was mold in that house. Um, so we watch for it. We look for it. I'm looking in all the common areas, which is under sinks and bathrooms, uh, things like that in garages where maybe there's a, a water softener system or a water heater. Um, we're looking for any type of growth, a growth appearing uh, substance. And if we find it, and I'll let them know, hey, it looks like you have a bio growth here. You might wanna get this tested by a, a mold testing company. And, and if it comes back positive as one of the um, toxic versions, there's, there's millions of strands of mold. There's only a few that are toxic, but if it comes back as one of those, then you're know, gonna wanna get it remediated. Right. Um, and so that's part of the, I guess, and from that point on, it goes into more your hands and part of the negotiation process, depending on what you find, I suppose. Sure. Someone explained it to me, and correct me if I have the analogy wrong, it's sort of like allergies, right? Some people are allergic yeah. to seafood, some people are allergic to grass, some people are allergic to the sun. Yeah. Um, so like the mold, like the, the impact of mold varies per person. Correct. You're saying that that person, that inspector could walk into a place and already immediately sense that there's mold or yeah. somebody else may not. Exactly right. And, and in my case, um, I can usually tell just by the smell. I'm not allergic to it, but if I walk into a house, I can kind of, you know what, I'm gonna, I suspect there's something here and I'm going to be looking harder for it just because it, it hits me a little harder. Um, and that's a, a per person thing. Everybody's a little different. We have uh, tendencies to, to react to th things differently that are in the air. Makes sense. Makes sense. I think all, in the same realm, lead-based paint mm -hmm. right yeah. lead-based paint talk to us a little bit about that what's the do we still have lead in our paint was uh, it a certain don't. time frame that it did yes what happens yeah so uh anytime you're in a house that was built in 1978 or prior you're likely to be surrounded by lead-based paint um, even if it's a 79 1980 home you, there's a chance because some of the builders had it on their shelves and they were using it up um, but more so 78 and prior. The concern with lead-based paint is how it affects our, our, our brain, our minds, especially uh, young minds. The developing child's brain uh, can be susceptible to, to lead heavy metals, right? That's what there's a big, uh, big concern with vaccines. Some people are anti-vaxxers because they say there's heavy metals in the vaccines and it's affecting their children. It's the same thing. Um, so lead-based paint, uh, how does it pose a danger to somebody? It's paint, it's dry, it's on the wall. Well, in that state, it really doesn't, unless again, you're chewing on the wall. Um, but lead dust created by opening and closing uh, wood frame windows that are painted with lead-based paint, that's where it comes into effect. It, it will Jeez. get into the house, it'll get into the carpet, on the floor, on the walls. And then outside uh, where the paint is subject to weather, you get cracking, chipping, peeling paint and it falls down into the soil and stays there because it's heavy and uh, children play in the dirt. You know, I play in the dirt, I'm still a kid. Um, so they're out there creating dust and they have a, a likelihood of breathing that in or absorbing that in some way. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I know that these are the concerns. So what do you do? Um, I don't test for lead-based paint. I let you know that uh, it's a high likelihood that you may have it in this home 
And then I'll let you know that you may want to have some samples tested. And if it comes back that you do have lead-based paint, you can check the soil as well. Um, and then you can look at removing the top few inches of the soil around the home, the immediate perimeter of the home, and replacing it with, uh, with other soil. And that's how you get rid of it. It's gone at that point. Interesting. Um, the paint inside that sounds the like a relatively easy fix in that sense relatively easy fix yeah you know i mean it's a few yards of, of dirt that is hauled in and hauled away um inside the house it's it's encapsulated most likely yeah, tell us a little bit about that because some homes it might not have on the exterior but might have it in the interior and mm -hmm. yet at the same time there's been multiple homeowners who have purchased it they've repainted to the colors that they wanted and so and it's an older home, 1950s, 1940s, or even one of the homes I have, 1920. There you go. Should we expect there to be lead-based paint, lead -based paint, even though it's been repainted multiple times now? Yeah, you should, because you don't strip an interior wall, typically. You just paint over the paint that's there. So you're going to likely find lead-based paint behind it, but it's behind it. It's behind many layers, many years of latex paint. It's encapsulated, so to speak. So it's really not a concern. Again, unless you have wood frame windows that you're opening and closing that that are uh, original to the house or at least have been there since 1978 or prior. Um, and then, then you wanna look at, okay, these windows have been here and I've been using them. The paint's probably long worn away and it's now been latex paint that's been wearing in there. But just know that that's where the concern would be. Um, it, it's sort of like, uh, we talked about asbestos earlier. Um, on the HVAC ducts, some of them were coated with asbestos in, in homes as a uh, sort of an insulator. And that coating sometimes would start flaking and chipping. Uh, one of the authorized repairs I've seen is they coat it basically, for lack of better terms, paint. They paint over it to encapsulate that asbestos. So it's sort of the same thing. You know, you're, you're encapsulating the lead paint. But how, how do you resolve it? If, so there's most likely a high certainty that there is lead. Um, should you resolve it? Should it be a something concern? What would you need to do? That would be a case by case uh, and individual preference. Um, if your home, you mentioned you're in a 1920 home. I, I'm sure knowing you, it's a very nice home. Um, if it was in the state of being remodeled or you bought it and it needed a lot of repair and there's a lot of flaking paint. Uh, in that case, outside, I would make sure that I had the painter scrape as much as he could, um, sand, scrape, paint, primer paint. And then after that, I would test the soil. And if I have young children and remove them, remove the soil um, and replace it. Inside the house on the interior walls, I would just paint. Uh, around the window casings, I would scrape sand and then paint to make sure I got rid of it all. Makes uh, sense. That's me personally in a, in a situation where the paint is in disrepair. I, I didn't say I was in a 1920s home. I, oh. I don't know if I would, how comfortable my family would be, but I know of clients who have properties okay. there in the 1920s. Just okay. want to clarify that just a little bit. <laughs> Deborah was like, wait, you have a 1920s home? You didn't tell me about? Uh-oh. And they're awesome. I Bro. love the character in those old homes. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Danny, I know we're coming up already against the time, but wow. if you don't mind me asking, I have a few additional questions, maybe five, 10 minutes extra. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Um, so there's questions in regards to how do you prepare for a home inspection, whether it be a buyer or a seller? How do you prepare for a home inspection? Well, for a seller, um, you wanna make sure that you, you declutter the areas that the inspector is gonna need access to. Uh, he needs to get into the attic, so make sure that you don't have any couches in the way or things like that. If the access is in a closet, a bedroom closet, please clear that stuff off the shelf because we're not supposed to touch any of your personal belongings. Um, within reason, I mean, if there's a shoebox or two, I'll move it. But if you've got, you know, all your high school stuff up there and books and things like that, I can't, you know, I'm, I can't be liable for that, nor would you want me going through that, that stuff. So please clear that out garages, make sure I have access to that water heater. A lot of times, you know, I understand these people are getting ready to move, right? So they fill the garage, we all do that. But keep in mind, in order to move, the people buying your house need to have this inspector get in here and take a look at things thoroughly. And that includes water heaters and water softeners and things you find in the garage like that. So make sure there's a path to that. Um, we, we don't want locked doors. A lot of times I'll come in and there's one locked door here or there and there's no explanation. Sometimes, you know, they've got 
valuables. Okay. But uh, sometimes I just forget, you know, today I, I, and this is happening more and more, the electrical panel was locked. They had a, a master paddle lock on it and no key anywhere. Um, I need to get into the electrical panel to see it. So that's, uh, that's extra money that the buyer now is obligated to spend to have me come out later when that's opened up. And they will likely ask you, the seller, to pay for it because it wasn't ready when it was supposed to be. So just make, the, make sure the house is ready for me as a seller, as a buyer. Um, to prepare yourself, uh, just know that there's going to be findings in the home. There is no perfect home. Don't look at this with an emotional attachment or an emotional reaction. Understand that everything is fixable for the most part. I have never seen a house yet that is not fixable, a complete teardown. Um, there's always going to be something and uh, inspections can be scary. So I work hard at, at speaking with a calm tone and putting things into perspective rather than just walking in there and saying this is wrong and this is wrong, that's wrong and that needs to be fixed and oh by the way that's a fire hazard and someone's going to get electrocuted. Well those things may be true but there's a better way of ex expressing that. <laughs> sure. um, and that's why we appreciate you Danny. Uh, we would we as a team, the Ron Arnold team and a lot of our fellow colleagues have been utilizing Danny Swanson not because we're we get a kickback or anything like that. We trust that Danny providing not only us, but our clients, the best information for them. Because if it's not a good idea for them to purchase, or it's going to be significant amount of revisions or costs to, to fix the things that have come up in the home inspection, we're going to advise to walk, right? Unless the seller is able to address it. And so Danny has a fair understanding of that. He's been in the business for over 10 years, and he's been doing this for a long time. And he has a good idea and able to provide consultation to buyers and sellers on what to do and how to best go about a solution that is, is a win-win for all parties. So that's why we, we trust Danny. And that's why I love having you on here, Danny. Appreciate you doing Thank that. You. And that's one of the things I appreciate about the Ron Arnold team. Um, I can sit there and, and tell you straight out, look, this is a big expense. This is a big problem. I don't know that this is the best idea. And that's just my opinion. And I'm not going to sway a buyer one way or another, but I can be honest with every agent on that team and not worry about them being upset that I'm finding issues. Right. Cause there are agents out there. They're like, Danny, I know there might be some issues, but hush, hush, let's get this <laughs> deal done so I can get my paycheck. You know, don't yeah. need to bring all that stuff up. Yeah. You know, fortunately for me, um, I guess it'd be for anybody, but I look at it as a blessing. There are those agents out there and they don't use me. They use me once or twice and then they move on because they don't want a thorough inspection. They want their deal to go through. So I don't really hear from them too much. And when they do call and I know it's an agent that's kind of in that, that pocket, my schedule's full. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So those are, those are good things to prep. I, I, I forgot to ask, but electrical panels is a big one as well. You see certain types of electrical panels and they are, could be, they could be of concern. Can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the, the two biggies um, are Zinsco and Federal Pacific panels. Um, uh, <laughs> they, the, 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 there's an inherent design flaw just with those panels themselves in the breakers. Uh, the Zinsco panel, uh, the breaker has been known to fail and catch fire. Now it is a small percentage, but yet it's there. So I let every client know that, look, this panel right here was prone to, to failure and fire. It was linked to some fires. And I give them a link to look up themselves so that they can educate themselves on, on what's going on with those. And I advise them, you know, you might want to consider upgrading this panel and just get that worry out of your mind for the future. Um, same thing with Federal Pacific, uh, the way the breakers would attach, the attachment comes loose over time and they start, they start arcing and which can cause a fire. So it's the same, same kind of situation, two different panels, two different uh, causes, but same similar results. And I'm always alerting my clients if, if they've got those panels. And then also I tell them my personal experience. You know, I, I see these day in and day out. Uh, some inspectors I know won't even open up a Zinsco or Federal Pacific panel because they're afraid they're going to cause damage. I will open them up. I can do that without causing damage. Um, I've owned a Zinsco panel in a home, in an older home that I had built in the 50s and with a newer HVAC system on it. And we quite literally, no joke, ran that air conditioning 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the hot times of the, the summer in Ontario. And I knew I had a Zinsco panel and I knew that they, they 
they were prone to failure. So I would pay attention to how it sounded when that AC would kick on. And I would go in there and look at that panel and make sure that the breakers look like they're in good shape and there's no arcing going on. So when you have those panels, I let my clients know if it's something you're not planning on upgrading anytime soon, at least annually have an electrician take a look at this thing and see if there's any issues that are coming to light. So like you're saying, there's a lot of people who have these type of panels. You yourself yeah. had one, there is no yeah. issues. And yet at the same time, like there is an inherent flaw with that product. And so it's, it's important to check on it on at least a yearly basis or I, that's my recommendation out of the contract or get that revised or repaired. Yeah. Cause typically it's about $3,000 to replace a panel. Um, there's literally millions of these panels out there in service right now, as we speak, most of your older apartment buildings, every one of your apartment complexes has a, a Zinsco panel. Most of your homes built in the fifties and sixties have a Zinsco panel. And uh, it was supposed to be recalled. Uh, Zinsco actually went uh, belly up and was were uh, bought out by Sylvania, who phased out that panel. So it never actually went through a recall process. Um, on the Federal Pacifics, I'm not sure what the demise was at the end for the company, but I know the same thing. There's millions of them out there in service today. How many fires were caused by them? It was a small number, but it's there and you can't ignore it. For sure, for sure. Danny, you've provided a wealth of information during this time, during our webinar. We thank you for that. For those who are trying to find out some more information about you or have some questions for you, what's the best, best place to reach you at? Uh, I'm easy to catch. Um, I only have one phone number. It's my cell phone. And it's 951-271-0578. Uh, you can email me at swansoninspections at gmail.com. You can go to my website, which is swansoninspections.com, and you can email me through there as well. So uh, three easiest ways to catch me. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Um, you can try to catch me through there, but uh, the direct method is better. Yeah. Yes. Because oftentimes you're on your job and it's going to oh, be hard to be able to access those type of platforms. Yeah. I typically, um, if I don't answer the phone, it's not because I'm not around. It's because I'm doing an inspection. And as soon as I'm done, I will return that call if you leave a message. You can also text me at that number and I usually will respond right away because I'm already on my phone doing the inspection through my phone. So the text comes through, I can answer you right away and, and get things handled. But nobody wants to hear their inspector talking on the phone through the house when he's supposed to be like, doing an inspection. Are you actually like focused <laughs> on my home or? Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, but just know that uh, um, if you don't catch me, I leave a message. I get right back to you as soon as I can within the day. Cool. Awesome. Danny, again, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate you and your service, your business expertise and professionalism, and also you as a friend as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Will. I appreciate all that with you as well. It's always great to see you. Awesome. Cool. Look forward to maybe doing another webinar one of these days and uh, hope you and your family stay safe. Until next time, take care. Bye. Bye for now.